Here we are on the set of our Cook's Country TV show. First up, I'm going to make salmon tacos. Now, I'm a taco purist, and I had to be convinced that salmon tacos are not only a thing, but they're worth cooking. And believe you me, they are the bomb. So first up, we have four pieces of salmon. Now, you can choose farm-raised salmon or wild salmon. The difference is in flavor and fat content. Farm salmon is fattier, and wild salmon is leaner. The, the difference between cooking is that farmed salmon, you want to cook to a slightly higher temperature, by about five degrees. So here I have four fillets of salmon, and we're going to season them with just some chili powder, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of black pepper. I'm going to mix this up, and we're going to sprinkle this right over all of the pieces of salmon, right onto the flesh. This not only adds flavor, but it gives the salmon a nice crusty finish that tastes good in the tacos. I'm just going to rub the salmon in it thoroughly so that no seasoning is left behind. All right, a quick wash of the hands, and then we'll get cooking. So when cooking fish, it's really helpful to use a non-stick pan because the fish won't stick, obviously. Uh, and as I said before, we test all sorts of kitchen equipment, and this is our winning non-stick pan. It's by OXO. And we tested this by not only cooking lots of fish, but tons of eggs. We also had a variety of people stand behind the stove and use a variety of skillets. I think it was eight skillets. We had big hands, small hands, lefties, righties, experienced cooks, and inexperienced cooks. And this was by far the winning skillet. And it makes a big difference. So I'm adding to the skillet a tablespoon of vegetable oil. Little trick, especially if you're monitoring your fat intake, putting vegetable oil for cooking in a squeeze bottle makes it really easy to get just the right amount into the pan. All right, so I'm heating this up over medium-high heat, and I'm looking for a change in the oil, how it looks in the pan. I'm looking for it to shimmer and then just start to smoke. That's how you know the pan's hot enough to sear the salmon. So that oil has started to shimmer right now, and I see wisps of smoke. That's how it's time to put the salmon in. I'm putting it in the flesh side down, skin side up. Mm. All right. So the salmon is going to cook for about two to four minutes on this first side. And you want to stick around. This is not a time to go AFK because you want to make sure to turn the heat down if it starts to smoke too vigorously. While that salmon is cooking, I'm going to throw together a quick slaw that makes these tacos out of this world. Now, most coleslaws are made with cabbage, but today we're going to make it with collard greens that are raw. Yeah, you can eat raw collard greens, and they're delicious, and they have a few more vitamins and nutrients than your average green cabbage. So you want a couple leaves of collards, about four ounces, and I've washed these already, obviously. And what I'm doing is I'm ripping the leaves down from either side of the stem. That stem is very tough, and... Uh, it's more like a toothpick than a vegetable, so you definitely don't want that in your slaw. All right, so set those aside. Then you can just fold these over and slice them up as you would cabbage for slaw. Oh, I hear some sizzle. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right, another 10 seconds, and let's flip these over. Oh, you see that gorgeous? This is the other fun part of this recipe. When you flip them over, they shrink up, which is just <laughs> silly fun. All right, that blackened seasoned top is perfect because that really gives the taco a good char flavor. All right, I'm going to turn the skillet down just a little bit. That's a little more smoke than you want. We're going to go for a few minutes on the second side. And you know the salmon is done when you temp it. You want the salmon to temp out around 125, 120 to 125. On the higher side, if it's farmed, on the lower side, if it's wild. All right, so a couple more minutes. I'm going to continue to slice up this chard. That's the chard. Now we're going to add some jicama, uh, which has a nice crunch. It has a mild flavor. You only need about half of a jicama like this. So you're going to cut it in half. Great raw. Goes in all sorts of nice salads. Just a nice uh, to have around. Also tastes good with hummus if you're doing a little crudite, which is another healthy snack. And so you can use a peeler, but the skin on this is pretty coarse. I find it easier to remove the skin with a knife. So just using the knife, shave down. There we go. All right, now I'm just going to cut the jicama 
into matchsticks. And the easy way to do that with any vegetable is you first cut it into slabs as thick as you want the matchsticks to be. In this case, about a quarter of an inch. Set this one aside. And then you lay the slabs down flat on the cutting board and you can just cut them into nice thin matchsticks. And if you get really confident, you can start to stack them. All right, so to add this to the bowl with the collard greens. All right, now it's been a minute or two. Let's take another look at that salmon. Give it a temp. All right, so these aren't all done at the same time. The bigger one needs a couple more minutes, which happens all the time if you're cooking chicken or steaks or pieces of fish. The bigger ones take longer to cook, so you have to pull them out as they finish cooking. Don't just pull them out all at the same time. That last piece of salmon is done. Out of the pan it goes. Slide the skillet to a cool burner. We're gonna let that salmon cool for a little bit while we finish up the slaw. Next into the slaw is some red onion, which I'm going to slice thinly. Now, if you didn't have a red onion, you could use another sweet onion, like a Vidalia or a Walla Walla. And we're gonna slice this onion thinly, and there's a trick to slicing onions thinly. There's two ways to cut it. You can go from pole to pole, where you get nice, sharp shards, or you can go against the grain, where you get rainbows. And yes, we've tested it both ways and found that when you go pole to pole with the shards, they hold together better, especially in a salad. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do. So here is an onion. I've peeled it, half an onion. I've peeled it, I've taken out the root end and the other end, but you want the layers to stay together while you cut them as much as you can. If they come apart, it's not a big deal. You can still cut them separately. But the key is when you're cutting pole to pole is you wanna angle the knife as you slice. So you wanna sort of mirror the shape of the onion. Now halfway through, I like to tip it on its end and start from the beginning again. And as you get to the middle, stop it when you dare. All right. And sometimes taking things apart like this, like an onion by its layers or even a cabbage by its layers, makes it easier to slice thinly. So there's no shame in your game if you do that. All right. All right, so there's half an onion. Mm. To this, we're gonna add some sliced radishes. So to slice these thin, I'm gonna take each radish, I've already washed them obviously, I'm gonna cut them in half because it gives you a flat side to work against, which makes it a lot easier. So then you can just slice down and slice them nice and thinly. All right, so here we have the radishes. And last but not least, we're gonna add some fresh cilantro leaves. I'm not gonna chop these up. They're pretty in their whole form, almost like another green, a lettuce green. And we're gonna add some lime juice. These juicers are the best. Now, I know a lemon would denote that you should use lemons, but it works for both lemons and limes, I found. So you wanna put some lemon juice on there, a tablespoon or two. Mmm and some lime zest. All right, so that's it for the slaw. So you just wanna mix this all up and all the collards and jicama and the radishes have a lot of good complex carbs, which again sustains a blood sugar for a period of time, along with some great vitamins and other nutrients. So this is a more healthy version of a coleslaw. Oh, last but not least, add a little bit of salt. I like using kosher salt. I think it has a better flavor than the iodized table salt, but both work perfectly fine here. And the slaw is done. Salmon's done, slaw's done. Last but not least, let's heat up some tortillas. Here I have corn tortillas, and there's lots of ways to heat them up. You can heat them up in the microwave. They get nice and soft, but they don't get any of that char. 
Uh, you can grill them. That gives a lovely flavor. Or if you have a gas stove top, this is how I like to heat them up. It's also kind of fun. So you just put the flame on medium high and you just drop the tortilla right on the flame and you keep your eye on it so it gets nice and toasted. And the level of toasting is up to you. Me personally, I kind of like it on the charred side, but not everyone does. Oh, see, that's perfect. That nice charred texture. Mm hmm And if you're really good and you're doing lots of them, you can get all the burners going and all the tortillas everywhere. That's just, that's just a game. All right, so into a tortilla warmer. It, it looks stupid, I know, but it works like a charm. It keeps tortillas warm for hours. So worth uh, picking one of these up if you like to make tacos. Slather on some crema. This crema, uh, I made in the food processor. It's mostly avocado, a little bit of yogurt, again, a little bit of protein, along with some lime and some cilantro. And you wanna smooth that onto the tortilla. So this recipe makes about 12 tacos, but I'm only gonna assemble three here. Uh, now, now I'm looking at the camera guys, they're drooling, so maybe I should make a few extra. <laughs> All right, we'll make five tacos. So put a little bit of that crema on. Now we're gonna take the salmon, and I like to use my hands for everything. Of course you could use forks and break it apart, but I feel like your hands are more delicate. And this uh, skin on the bottom, not officially part of the recipe, but it is a great snack if you're into that sort of thing. So I like to just break the salmon apart delicately onto each taco. And I know, I bet you thought that salmon might look a little dark, but now that you're breaking it up and putting it in a taco, it looks just right. You want that char to give you uh, that flavor of a grilled taco, even though we're not outside. Ooh, someone's gonna get a little salmon skin in theirs. All right. All right, clean my hands off here. Now up for a little bit of slaw. Mm, the slaw makes it. The flavor of raw collards, if you've never had it, is really interesting. All right. And there you have it. Put some tacos in a plate so everyone can have one. That's for you guys, you camera guys. Meanwhile, I'm gonna eat this one. <laughs> yep. Mm. Mm -hmm. So flipping good and so easy. Now I'm going to show you how to perfectly hard boil an egg, which isn't hard, but it took us a few tries to get it just right. We actually cooked hundreds of eggs. We candled eggs. We held them up with flashlights in a dark place to see how to get the shell to slip off easily. And the trick we found is twofold. One, you got to use large eggs and they have to be cold from the fridge. Second, you steam the eggs. You don't want to start them in cold water. You want to start them in the hottest water possible, which is steam, because what will happen is that will cook the eggs really quickly. And as the eggs cook quickly, the whites will condense and pull away from that sticky membrane that sits just underneath the shell. That's what makes eggs hard to peel. So steaming is the way to go. Here I have six large eggs fresh from the fridge. Now you can use this method to make as many as a dozen eggs. You just need a larger pot. So I have them in a steamer basket here. In this pot I have an inch of hot steaming water. In the eggs go. On the lid goes. All right, now here's the other magic quotient. 13 minutes exactly, not a minute more or a minute less. Uh, gives you the perfect yolk that's cooked all the way through with no green ring. All right, so while those are cooking, let's make a quick smoothie. So in goes one whole banana. Next up, the secret ingredient. This is almond butter, a quarter cup of almond butter. And if you've never seen this little gadget, this little measuring gadget, it's called an adjustable measuring cup. And it means you can measure sticky things like honey or peanut butter really easily. Uh, speaking of honey, two tablespoons of honey. And we're gonna let this blend up, let that banana break down before we add the rest of the ingredients, just for a couple of seconds. All right, 
Next, we're gonna add some yogurt. Again, some more good protein. And this is just plain yogurt, a cup of plain yogurt. And this is just half a cup. Ah! And this is just half a cup of plain yogurt. A little bit of milk. This is the liquid that you're gonna to need to make the smoothie have some good consistency. As a quarter cup of milk. Last but not least, we're gonna add some berries. Now, we're gonna add frozen berries, two cups. And frozen berries are great here because you can buy them year round. And it, by using frozen fruit, you don't have to add ice cubes, which can make the smoothies taste watery. So this is two cups of frozen berries. Although I have to say, I also love using frozen cherries, if you can find them, because a cherry almond smoothie is the best. All right, so now we're gonna put the lid on and let it rip until it's smooth. Also should point out, this is our winning blender. This is the Breville. Now, blender testings are one of our all times favorites because people really want to know if the high-end blenders are worth the money. Uh, this Breville really does everything the high-end blenders does, but it costs a lot less money. And when we tested them, we did mayonnaise, we did hollandaise, we did smoothies out the wazoo. We actually did kale smoothies. We dipped a paintbrush and we painted the smoothie onto a white sheet of paper so you could see how big the kale pieces were. Uh, and how sharp the blades were. And actually, this was the winner. All right, so here we go. A couple seconds. I forgot to add an ingredient. It's the littlest ingredient. It's salt. A pinch of salt goes a long way to make these smoothies tasting good. So just a pinch of salt. Back in it goes. That smells good. Oh, the other thing I should mention, of course we test kitchen equipment like I've been mentioning all along. We also taste test in products. For example, this is our winning almond butter. And when we taste products, we have at least 23 people sitting at a table, no talking, and you have a variety of products in front of you. And there are no labels, so you'd have all these almond butters in unlabeled cups. And you'd taste them and you'd mark down what you think about each one. Now, cool thing about tasting, not everyone at the table is starting with the same sample. That's because if one sample is really potent and it has an effect on the later samples, that doesn't replicate around the table. The other thing is that in every tasting, two samples are exactly the same. You don't know which two. And this is because if you like it the first time, then you taste a few, and then you hate it the second time, well, you're not having a good tasting day. Your palate isn't on. So uh, your cheek gets thrown out. So if you like it the first time, like it the second time, or what have you, it means your palate's on point, so your tasting score gets included in the tally. Uh, so this is our winning almond butter, Barney. Um, and we do this with all sorts of ingredients in the supermarket, from canned tomatoes to chicken broth. And chicken broth is probably the most important, because if you choose the wrong chicken broth, it'll make your soup taste like dishwater. And of course, all these taste tests and equipment reviews, you can find on our website. Mm. Oh, that looks good. Oh, look, there's a little extra for the camera guys. <laughs> oh, eggs are done. 13 minutes, not a minute longer. Turn the heat off. Ha ha, and they are perfect. Now the next step to easy peel hard boiled eggs is to take them right from the steamer basket into ice water. You want to cool them down quickly. You don't want them to cook any longer. So you want to get all the eggs right into an ice bath. And you want to let them sit here for at least 15 minutes till they really cool through completely. And <laughs> by the magic of TV, they like they used to say in the 70s on my favorite cooking shows, I have some already done. Now let me show you how easy these are to peel because this is the true magic. It just slides off. And you get perfect eggs. So if you're making deviled eggs, there's no divots whatsoever. And here, let me get a knife and cut this open and show you how perfectly cooked it is on the inside. Aha, voila, look at that. No green ring, edge to edge, the yolk is perfectly done but not overdone. <laughs> That's the key to a perfectly hard cooked eggs. I hope you found this helpful and of course all this information and more you can find on our website, americastestkitchen.com.